welcome you in. And, and Dave Ramsey Mayer is our curator who has joined us this fall. So we're very excited with um, everything that's going on in the gallery. So please stay tuned on Facebook and through our website and keep connected through this time through COVID. And you know, we're always here. You can make an appointment to come into the gallery at any point to come and see the installations. We have a beautiful um, theme around Indigenous culture. We also have our artist in-house, Raheel Patil, who also has some wonderful um, scrum that he does um, and artistry uh, throughout the week. So again, please just reach out and um, they'll be able to coordinate me into City Hall and, and once again reconnecting with us at the Art Gallery. This is all good. Thank you. We look forward to seeing everyone here and please stay tuned to our new show, Fall Show This Fall, and also for next year. Thank you. Thank you everybody for welcoming me to the Art Gallery. It's an honor to now be named your new curator. I am extremely honored to present to you John and Peter's talk, if these words can speak. Hello, um, my name is Don Russell, and uh, this is my, my good friend Peter Schuler. And um, this, this uh, show that we put together here, well, we, we said, uh, we titled it, If These Woods Could Speak, Don Russell in Conversation with Peter, Rus or Peter Schuler. Um, I was initially invited a couple of years ago to do a solo show here in this space. And around that same time, it's about the time that I met Peter Schuler for, for the first time. And, um, and the, first, the first evening I met Peter, he showed me some of his photos, some of the images that we see here on the wall today. And I, I, I was immediately drawn to them and intrigued by them and mystified and there was so much there um, and it, the more I, I started to talk to Peter about it and some of the ideas and, and things that were happening in these photos or why these the, the story of, of the photos themselves when they were taken or why they were taken I, I saw something there that was um, uh, very meaningful for me, a way of making art that communicates uh, other things beyond just the human world. And I was uh, deeply influenced by that. And, and of course, this, this, um, the mirror image, the use of the mirror image um, was another part of what influenced me. Because when you look at these mirror images, you see, you see faces emerge, you see beings emerge, you see you see stories emerge, and in a way, it seemed to me like, um, like, like this, the story, the stories that the land holds, and and that's what I became uh, intrigued with mostly was like, what is what is this, what are they communicating to us? It seemed like something was reaching out beyond, um, and and with that mirror image. Uh, that influenced me to do these works, this, these four paintings here. It's all one, one work, um, but it is, it's an ash tree, a bark of an ash tree, and then it's, it's reversed, so you've got that mirror image. And I was interested in what would emerge from that, just as in the, Peter's photos, the things that we see emerge here, same idea. What, what will emerge when I put these two together? And I find a number of things there that have that come out to me. I see a, I see a large uh, butterfly or moth-like shape that comes from it. That's that to me um, says a lot about um, metamorphosis and and in relationship to this ash tree. I mean, what's happening to it is the ash tree is being attacked by this bug, the emerald ash borer, which comes from Asia, and it's wiping out ash trees by the billions. And, and it's one of these things that 
it's really hard to sit there and witness that and see that. I'm sure we've all had the, the experience of driving out in the countryside and you see quite a few dead trees in a stand of living trees. And you realize that's a lot of trees. They're all going to be down on the ground very soon. And it's all from this bug. Um, so, you know, the hope is that the tree will find a way to come back that it'll be resilient to that, that it won't disappear like we're seeing it, this, like we are witnessing dis it disappear, that, that, it will, um, that it'll find a way to fight that off and come back. And maybe, maybe that involves uh, other, other birds, for instance, or other insects to help restore that health to the tree. But for the time being, it looks like we're watching this tree disappear. And that's a hard thing to see. So this work comes from that. And when I, so when I did the mirror image, put it together, and I see this, this moth-like image come from that, it speaks to me about, uh, about hope, perhaps, about uh, metamorphosis. Um, I mean, that's, that's where these, these ideas came from. But a new thought has come to my mind um, lately. And that is when the, you know, we look at the ash tree and the ash tree disappearing, and, and we see that as a great imbalance, that tree is going to disappear. Ash trees make up around 25% of the trees in Ontario. That's an extraordinary number of trees. It's hard to imagine that. I started to think, well, why are 25% of the trees ash trees? Because in an established forest, there probably wouldn't be that many ash trees. And if you look at how the ash tree behaves, it, it, it very readily uh, seeds itself. The seeds are plentiful. If, you, if you're in a field near an ash tree, you will see many, many seedlings. It just takes off. So I started to think, these forests that were taken down two or 300 years ago, and made, you know, they were taken down to clear, to clear the area for farming. And uh, some little woodlots would be left, but there would have been a huge imbalance in removing the health of those forests and how, how those trees work together and live together and in, in, uh, also with animals and just the whole, the whole ecology of it. That I started to think that perhaps when those forests were taken out, the ash tree came in so readily because it can. And perhaps it being at that 25% in the first place was an imbalance. You know what I'm saying? That this, this could be, um, this could be, re this could be writing perhaps that imbalance, what we're seeing with the ash tree. It's a very complicated way to look at it. Um, but, but ultimately, what I was up trying to do with this work was to honor that tree, honor its, its existence, and at the same time, honor the work that I saw in Peter's photographs that deeply influenced me in, in how I was going to proceed to make images from that point forward. So I see that, you know, that those things coming together um, I, I'm not sure what else I can say about, about the work. Uh, perhaps I'll pass it over to Peter. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> um, I'll give you again in the end of the day, and I'll give you a little bit of the day, and I'll give you a little bit of the six stations in the day. Uh, in the day, I'll give you a little so in uh, that little bit of language that I have, I, I give you my name. I belong to the Turtle Clan. Um, I live on uh, Six Nations and Good Credit. Um, and I don't have much language. And before we started, um, someone suggested we do uh, a land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was offered that I could read one. But I really can't read, so I'm on the lake. Um, <laughs> I can't read. Um, 
my Anishinaabe name, it means writing, writing man, or one who writes. And um, so I will do the land acknowledgement that I usually do, which is probably not one you've heard before. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge the ones who are here first. The Metikok Nation, the Gigo Nation, the Awesanak Nation, the Manadongsak Nation. Those are just a few of the nations that were here first. And some of those don't exist anymore. Some of the Venetia aren't here anymore. And you're probably saying, I never heard of those nations before. And that's because in all the land acknowledgements, we don't acknowledge them. And if we don't acknowledge them, we too will disappear. And those ones that I'm talking about are the ones who were here first. And they were here before the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat. Those are the people nations. But the ones I mentioned first are the animals and the trees and the plants and the fish. And if you want to acknowledge the land, you need to acknowledge the land and what grows on there. Because if we always put the people first, which we have done for a long time, ever since somebody showed up and said we have to do that, then we will disappear. Because we will continually destroy those that we don't recognize. And so anytime I've asked, been asked to do a land acknowledgement, I always start with the ones who are here first. And after the Anishinaabek, the Huron, the Haudenosaunee, and you can visit a whole whack of them across Canada. After those came, five or six hundred years ago, somebody got lost and they came. I think it was Christopher Columbus. And so at that time, we were told that we can't do what we always done for thousands of years, and that we had to stop living the way we did, that we had to stop acknowledging those what came first. And they said, oh, you can't worship trees. But we weren't worshiping trees. We were giving thanks to that tree for what the tree gave us. And we were acknowledging the animals for what they gave us. We acknowledged the fish for what they gave us. And today, We've come to that point where we don't acknowledge much of anything except our paycheck, except how to get more money, how it's got the best car, who's got the biggest house. That's what we acknowledge. We acknowledge greed, but we don't even know what greed is. We call greed ambition. We call greed smarts. We call greed all kinds of things, but we don't call it what it is. And uh, these photos that are here on the wall, one of the things that's important to us as uh, First Nations people is to have a name. And it's important that you have more than just John Smith or Joe Blow for a name. You need a name that those ones who came first will recognize you with. And so I was not raised without, without a null language, uh, without, uh, I was raised without anything like that. Knowledge of ceremony. Um, the knowledge my ancestors had. And it wasn't until I was, uh, about 50 years old that I was given a name. And the name you're given, that's what the rest of creation, rest of creation recognizes you by. And so when I go to the, uh, out on the land, I try to always remember to take some tobacco 
and introduce myself and state why I'm there and give thanks to hear the birds, to see the trees, to see whatever else is there, even the insects. And I got vaccinated last week. I picked up a piece of wood and there was a hornet on the bottom of that and he stung me on the end of my finger. And I said, Miigwech, for the vaccination. I didn't kill that hornet. He's got as much right to be there as I do. And so, with these images, the morning after I was given my name, I was up in uh, the Soxing, very sound direction there. And as I was driving home, I thought to myself, this is the first time that I can introduce myself to my relatives, the rest of creation. And I want to, to find something to remember this day by, and I want something, a uh, beautiful tree or scenery or something. And I kept looking as I was driving, and I was looking for something nice, a nice tree or rock or something. And I passed over this little stream that went under the highway. And about two miles down the road, something said, you have to turn around, you have to go back and you have to look there. So I turned around, I came back to where that stream was and I parked my truck and I had uh, uh, an AE-1 camera and a Canon, I think it was a 650 or something like that. And so I got out of the truck and I started walking up along that stream. And I could see all these rocks and things, you know. So I started taking pictures. And I didn't see any of these things that are there, but I knew something was there. And so I took pictures, took pictures, and I ran out of film. So I thought, well, I'll go back and get the other camera and I'll continue. And it was an overcast day. It wasn't bright, sunny, it was overcast. And when I come back with the other camera, it started to rain. And so when I was raining, there was a little bit of a breeze and the, uh, the water started to ripple, so you couldn't get, take the pictures. And at that time, I only knew one song. So I took my hand drum, I sang that song, I put some tobacco on the water, and the rain stopped, and the wind calmed down, and I kept on taking those pictures. And by the time I was done, I think I had three or four rolls of film. And I continued on my way. And so that was a Sunday morning. And the next morning I had to go to work. And I thought, I would really like to see what these pictures turn out like. I know there's something in that picture that I, I can't see, but I know there's something there. And so I had to leave for work really early. And I was really anxious to get these pictures developed. So I stopped in Caledonia at the camera store. Just you know, 6.30 in the morning or something. I took those rolls of film and I set them on the windowsill and I left, went to work. But the idea that I'll phone this guy at, uh, whenever he opens and let him know they're there. And uh, so I got busy at work and I forgot all about that until in the middle of the afternoon I thought, geez, I wonder, wonder if somebody stole those pictures or picked it up or whatever, I wonder what happened. So I phoned the guy right away and his name was Farley. And, uh, and so I said, I left some photographs, there are some rolls of film to be developed on the window. He said, oh yeah, I found them. He said, very interesting. He said, I should have known that it was you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so that evening, I managed to get there in time before they closed and I got those pictures. And when I took them out, I started looking. And you can take these pictures and you can turn them upside down you can do everything you want with it. And you will always see something different. Even if you look at that picture and you go back half an hour later, you look again, you'll find something in there that's different. And the first time these, uh, this is only the second time these have been exhibited, but the first time was in NEPA Gallery in Hamilton about 1998 or 99, and they've been sitting in that basement. 
for all that time. And when I met Don, I was talking about these pictures and I said, you know, I think they were ahead of their time. And that people weren't ready for that. And when it was first uh, put up, the exhibit was called To Speak Without a Tongue. And there's words on that end over there that go with all these pictures. And these aren't all of them. There's still a few, I think, well, I can't remember how many that aren't here. But the one on the end, I call it the Sunday Man. And from here, you can see this horrific looking face. But when you're standing right in front of it, you can't see that right away. You have to back up a certain way, distance away, then all of a sudden this pops out at you. And the reason I call it the Sunday Man is because of what the Sunday Man promised us. When the Sunday Man came, he promised us all kinds of things. He said, you can't worship those animals. You can't do all this stuff. You have to believe what we believe. That promise, all those things he promised, they didn't come. We don't have our land. The animals disappeared. All those things have changed. And, you know, our ancestors lived here for thousands and thousands of years, and they didn't destroy where they lived. And I had this discussion with this minister one time. You ever hear a minister swear? <laughs> They're not supposed to swear. I had this discussion with this minister, and uh, he uh, was kind of full of himself, that guy. And he was quoting all kinds of verses from the Bible. And I said, well, you must have studied a lot. Oh yeah, I know this book. And I said to him, what does that, uh, Second Kings 18, 27, what does that mean? Well, I have to look that up. He started looking it up. I want to tell you what it says. But it's something about some people who are sitting on a wall and they're drinking their own pee and uh, eating their own feces. And I said, what does it mean? And he says, well, uh, you know, and he didn't have an answer. I said, you know, I was raised going to church and I quit when I was 21. And I've never been back since. And I used to teach Sunday school. And I said, when I was 21, one day I thought to myself, I can't do this anymore because I don't accept this. I don't believe this. And so I went to the minister and he was a really nice man. I said, you know, I'm not coming back anymore. And he said, why not? I said, well, I can't accept this. And if I keep coming back, then I'm just a hypocrite. And he said, well, what are you going to do now? I said, well, I'm going to try and find out what my ancestors did. Then. Because I think that's what I should do. And so I asked myself all these questions. I asked myself, where is the Garden of Eden? Did it really exist? What was that place? I asked myself a lot of questions and I didn't like any of the answers I came up with. And I thought to myself, was there really an apple? And what about that snake? And I came to the conclusion that snake got a bad name. He got a bad rap. Maybe he wrapped himself around the tree, I don't know. But he got a bad rap. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, you know, that garden, it must have existed someplace. But where is it? 
And finally, I came to the conclusion that the garden was the earth. And that everyone was put in that garden and given instructions of how to live there so they wouldn't destroy it. And then one day, someone decided they're not going to follow those instructions anymore. And they began to eat up their part of the garden, they began to destroy it. And I believe that is the apple that they forgot or didn't want to follow the rules anymore. And so I said to that minister, the one who swore at me, I said, in this discussion, I told him about how I quit going to church and why I quit going to church and all those questions I asked myself and about where I thought the Garden of Eden was and that the Garden of Eden still exists except we're destroying it. And I said, you know, when I used to go to church, they had an envelope and it was split in half. This half went to the church you're sitting in and the other half went to the missionaries. And I said, you know, I thought about that. And how that, when you put that money inside that thing where it goes to the missionaries, that those missionaries are gonna to go to South America or someplace like that. They're gonna try and find some people who don't follow Christianity. And they're going to go and convince them, just like you convinced my ancestors, that they can't do that, that it's wrong. And you're going to convince them that they can take as much as they want. They can do whatever they want. And so I asked that minister, so how does it feel, Snake, to deliver the apple? And that's when he started to swear at me. <laughs> and, uh, so these pictures, they start off with the Sunday man. The next one is to speak with a forked tongue. The next one, loss of innocence, and so on. Down to the end, and here at the end, you can see the English Bobby there. And the English Bobby is still here. He's the government of Canada. He's the one who's making sure that we keep on destroying following those laws that they put in place to take away the land.